The Navy's 10-year plan includes a 355-ship fleet that the department still needs to find a way to pay for. The Heritage Foundation's 2020 Index of Military Strength suggests that if the Navy wants to meet recommended strength levels, we're going to need a bigger fleet. Lieutenant Colonel Dakota Wood, U.S. Marine Corps retired as Senior Research Fellow for Defense Programs at the Heritage Foundation. He's editor of the Index. Dakota, welcome back. It's great to see you. Hey, great to be with you. What's your sense of the disconnect that Admiral Gilday talked about at the Surface Navy Association between where we are today, as you've assessed in the Index, right. and where he wants to get to and where Secretary, Acting Secretary Modley wants to get to in a 355-ship fleet. Well, you know, the Navy looks at demand, right? Yeah. Where do you want ships to be and how many ships do you need to have in that area to actually do the job that you're wanting them to do? And then they turn and they look at the fleet that they currently have, and there's a huge gap between the two. I mean, 200 Navy ships or so today, they've estimated in the past uh, needing four, almost 460 at the end of the Cold War, we had almost 600 ships just because of the need for presence and combat casualties and those sorts of things, right? So 460, not financially achievable mm -hmm. in a budget environment. They scaled it back and they said to do the minimum required, we need 355. So that's where that number really comes from. So jumping from 290 to 355 is a huge increase in shipbuilding and the manufacturing sector and then the money associated with that. And then you've got this huge debate between the Navy and outfits like uh, Congressional Research Service, GAO and CBO, Congressional mm -hmm. Budget Office, where the Navy, uh, according to CBO, for example, is underestimating the costs and uh, these other government organizations are saying it's going to be more expensive. So the short story is the Navy will need almost a 50 percent increase in annual funding uh, relative to their average of about 14 billion a year. I mean, you're talking 20, 24, upwards of 30 billion as you get into the late 2020s. The question that you posed there, and I think you phrased it rhetorically, but I think it's important to talk about, mm -hmm. is the question that Admiral Richardson discussed as CNO, and now we're seeing Admiral Gilday start to talk about it. The number's one thing, yeah. and, and we can go anywhere on the range that has been discussed. What do we want the fleet to do is the more right. important question because if we have, if, to, to fill that gap from 280 to 355, if we were to build 50 frigates, that doesn't necessarily mean anything as right. far as what we want to accomplish via the national defense strategy, right? Yeah, so if it's big ocean fighting uh, or you think it's going to be long range missile strikes, you need really kind of big ships, you know, large destroyers, cruiser class, that sort of thing. If you're inside the South China Sea, if you want to go into the Baltic Sea or up at the Mediterranean, distances are shorter, uh, draft uh, becomes an issue because of just some of the shallower waters, so it's a smaller sort of ship, you know, mm -hmm. shorter legs and distances. So this fleet architecture, and the Navy should be dropping their force structure uh, assessment here in the next week or two, and they'll talk about what does that fleet look like? You know, is it unmanned, a lot of small things, so you can do distributed operations, or just a fewer number of very large ships, which you really need for endurance and distance, packing a lot of power, you know, in these uh, types of platforms. So this big debate you know, about what kind of ship and how many of those types of ships that you build has really has not yet been resolved. And then you've got the Marine Corps now coming mm -hmm. in and saying, look, we're re-envisioning what it means to contribute to naval power projection, right? And we think we can do that with a different fleet architecture that supports amphibious operations in the contested littorals. So it's another variable that's mm -hmm. really been thrown into the mix, and we'll have to see what the Navy says here in the next uh, couple of weeks. With all of those variables and the debate that you're, dis that you're mm -hmm. mentioning, one place there's a debate seems to be between the Navy Department and the Office of Management and Budget. What do you make of that back and forth in the context of all the things we've well, talked you know, about? OMB today? is going to try to execute the president's plan, mm -hmm. right? Whichever president it is, you know, Reagan, Clinton, Obama, Trump, whoever. Uh, and so they're going to have a certain budget cap, you know, in the national budget, how much goes to all the different programs that are ongoing. And so when the White House through OMB comes back with a cap and we don't want to spend more than X about a month, now you're fighting uh, within you know, the Pentagon mm -hmm. for how do you distribute those funds. You know, our position at Heritage is that the defense budget is just too low relative to historical usage. I mean, we're not just inventing things, right? So if you're back in an era of great power competition, if you'd buy the national defense strategy issued under uh, Mattis's tenure as SecDef, uh, you know, we've gotten used to smaller budgets relative to workload 
because you're fighting terrorist groups with no navies, no air forces, no artillery, no armor, none of that. You know, so we could do what we needed to do with a smaller force. But if you're going potentially against China or a nuclear North Korea, or Iran or Russia, um, you know, these are big boy sorts of fights. And so you need a military that's equipped to do that, if for no other reason to, to deter the opponent because they think that you can actually bring something to the fight. We have about a minute left, Dakota, and that takes us full circle to sure. Admiral Gilday's comments yesterday, which basically was an argument for why the one-third, one-third, one-third mm -hmm. formula that we've seen over the last decade or so, maybe a little longer, right. doesn't work. And he referred back, as I mentioned in the headlines, to the Reagan era where the Navy had a bigger chunk of the action in the 1980s. Yeah, so where do you think the fight's going to unfold? Is mm -hmm. it more of a land, air kind of thing in Europe? Is it more maritime? naval and the Indo-Pacific, everybody's saying that our future is in the Indo-Pacific region. China is the big actor out there. Uh, yes, a role for land power, but it seems to be more naval and air, right? And so again, you look at a smaller fleet, uh, over half of the fleet is greater than 20 years old. All of the Los Angeles class, almost all of the carriers, all the ballistic missile submarines are all 20 years plus old. So we need to recapitalize this fleet huge amounts of money, and you're just not going to be able to get there with current budget levels. Dakota, thanks very much for coming. My pleasure. It's great to have Thank you back. You.